So, before we talk about encryption, we're just going to think back to about 15 years ago. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire was the big movie that year. So it's you know, a while ago, but it's not a crazy amount of time ago. Most applications stored their passwords in plain text, crypt, or MD5. Um, OpenWall released PHP Pass to combat this. Uh, and some of the big projects took it up at the time. The, the biggest answer on Stack Overflow for how to securely store passwords was this answer right here. So MD5 is still safe, according to this. Um, and it's not particularly aged very well. And the, the idea of today is to try and um, give advice that ages well, and, and you know, we don't look back and think that was a terrible thing to do. <coughs> so people who didn't take that advice, um, the, these sites have been breached subsequently. The, the number in brackets is the amount of passwords successfully recovered using this, uh, in, using this hashing method. So SHA-1, MySpace, got pretty, MySpace, LinkedIn, and Yahoo pretty much got all of their passwords recovered, even though they're using SHA-1. MD5, again, similar, similar sort of numbers. Badoo, Last.fm, eHarmony, all of them, almost all of the passwords got recovered. The ones that didn't get recovered, they were the ones that are actually quite secure. So if people are using like you know, 35 character passwords from their password manager, they're the ones that didn't get recovered. If you were using sort of like 16 characters, they, you would have been recovered. And probably the most famous is the plain text, Rock you. That's now included in Kali Linux as a default. So you, that's a word list that you can just use and, and iterate through. Um, so yeah, these are people who haven't used best practices, even though they're available at the time. Um, so at, at the time, e even back then when the, all these were breached, Bcrypt was, was a thing that came out in 1999. These were sites that used Bcrypt and how much of their database, when they got leaked, how much of them got um, reversed. So Dropbox got uh, reversed and, uh, sorry, got leaked, and then 22, almost 22% of theirs got, um, got their plain text passwords exposed. SHA-256, which came out in 2001. Again, it's, um, it was available at the time all of, these, uh, all of the other sites got released, but no one used it. And similar numbers here, so in the, in the low percentages, and then about 35. Argon2 is probably, if you were storing passwords today and you were looking for a scheme, this was, Argon2 is probably the one you should go with, but uh, there's not enough information about leaks for that yet, because no one's had their database leaked. Uh, the variability, so between the, the low, like the, the 3 and 1% to the 21 and 34, is down to password reuse, so people have used the old breaches where they've already reversed the passwords, and then, um, and they just tried those same passwords with the same credentials, and it's just worked on the next one, so, uh, even though they're much more secure, the higher numbers are purely down to the other sites that haven't, um, haven't done so well with securing their passwords. <coughs> so we think about the value of the data. If, you're, if your database does leak, you think about the value of it. And the obvious ones are credit cards. So if a credit card, plain text credit card info gets leaked, it's quite obvious how people can use that to, uh, for financial gain. Um, Merchant services are actually cracking down on credit cards, so it's much harder to use credit cards as people would have used them 10 years ago because you, you can't just use thousands of credit cards anymore. Your merchant service will stop that. Passwords, they're used more for like, logging into other services and trying to extract um, money from other services. So if you, if you log into Amazon with someone's password, you, um, you used to be able to just um, change the shipping address, ship it to you, and then using that password, you, you get money out of it. Uh, the same thing happens with email addresses. So people log into your email with the password, they send a spam email to all of your friends because it becomes from you, it's more trustworthy, so uh, they get their product of however it is, that they're, they're getting their money out of it. PII, this is quite a new one and how it's being used. Uh, people don't often think that personal identifiable information leaking is, is much of an issue. Um, but I've got some examples which, which really show the value of PI being leaked. So TalkTalk, talk. Uh, does everyone know the TalkTalk talk got leaked a few years ago? It's probably one of the most uh, talked about um, database leaks of the UK history. Uh, there was two trust-based scams uh, this, uh, based around this on the early days. The first one, when it wasn't really publicly known, was um, people would ring the, the customers from the database because they'd have the, the phone number, the account number, all of their, their details, they'd ring the person, say um, that the, they haven't been paid their internet this month, they need to pay £30 now or, or risk being cut off. Um, to prove that they were definitely from TalkTalk, Talk, they would give you the TalkTalk, Talk, cut your TalkTalk Talk customer ID, because how else would they know that? Uh, so people did believe that, that their internet was going to be cut off and pay the £30 over the phone. 
so um, lots and lots of 30 pounds later, people, um, people lost a lot of money to it. The second one was when it w was known about. Uh, they would ring up the same people or, or like the same group of people and say, um, sorry, you, we, we, I'm from TalkTalk, Talk. we've lost all your data, we're going to give you like, £100 compensation. To do that, we just need your bank details. And uh, that, that ends as predictably as, uh, <laughs> as it seems. So people would give over their bank details, trying to get this £100, and uh, they don't get the £100 in the bank, sh uh, short story. <laughs> um, the IRS is the American tax system. They, they, uh, the tax system in America works slightly differently to the UK. So in America, uh, you get like one tax bill every year. Uh, so at the end of the year, people pay in, pay in monthly amounts because you only get one bill, so people pay it monthly just to try and estimate where they are. And a lot of people aim to overpay, so they get a refund when, when the tax year ends rather than have it a, a tax bill at the end of the year. Um, and then people have to log into the, the IRS system to do this. And to log into the IRS system, they, they've got um, a system where you, you, you tell them where you worked in a certain year, um, what your address was in a certain year, that they ask you questions that only you should know about yourself. That clearly isn't true when lots of companies are leaking your data. So people, like attackers would log in the day the uh, tax deadline opened, submit your tax return for you, get the check back to say that here, here's all the money that uh, so they'd say you've underpaid, uh, way overpaid your tax, get the big, big check. Then they'd cash that early days. You've got like, another month or so before you have to submit your tax. Um, so you log on legitimately to do that. And by that time, you've realized that someone's already submitted your tax return for you. And I, I think there was uh, half, a, half a billion dollars lost by this, just by people sending checks to people that they thought were other people. Uh, and again, that wouldn't have happened if, if everyone's personal data wasn't already out there. Emails with passwords and phone numbers. So this is this is quite new, really. This started last year. You'd get an email. I, I imagine everyone's received these emails. Um, you get the email saying that here's your password. I've hacked all of your accounts. I've um, I've seen you've been on some interesting websites, and I've got videos of that. And unless you release, uh, unless you pay this Bitcoin, I'm going to release it to all your friends. They didn't really have anything, but because they had your password and sometimes your phone number on there, it, it made people believe that they genuinely were in their system. And again, that's just a, another use of personal data. And uh, competition wins. It's, this is similar to the Talk Talk one. So um, I, I received one of these uh, in December last year. I got a text message. Um, my, my data had obviously leaked. Uh, it said where I was. So it, um, that the, the supermarket <laughs> closest to me, it, it had uh, the Asda closest to me. It said that I'd won their, their raffle this year by just by buying something from Asda. Um, and to claim it, I need to click on this link, fill in my details, and they'll, they'll send me the money over. And it, it's the same thing as before. They, they just want your bank details. But it, it makes it look real by giving the, the real branch that you were nearby. Like, because most people will shop in their, their closest supermarket. The supermarket is all public information. You can, you can log on and find out where all the supermarkets are. Uh, you know where the address is for the person because you've, you've got their postcode, and you can just find out which one's nearest. So again, it's, it's another use of personal data where people don't realize they're giving more money away, they're giving more uh, information away to, to lose the money. And breaches really are getting bigger. Marriott's lost 500 million records, uh, which is you know, huge. If Marriott's was a continent, this is where it would sit in the continent's population. It, it really, really is a, a huge leak, that one, and it had lots and lots of info in it. Um, Kim Zetter, she's uh, a journalist, um, they tweeted saying, uh, should encrypt, not encrypting your passports qualify as criminal negligence? It probably should, really. You should be encrypting all of your data. If, it, if, it's, if it's personal to a, a user and can be used in other ways, you should be trying to encrypt it. Um, this one actually happened yesterday. Um, someone found an unsecured database in China that was doing real-time tracking of people. So it, it uses facial recognition. And uh, you, can pr you can pretty much log into this database because there's no authentication on it. Just from anywhere, find out exactly where people were along with loads of their information. And it, it really is quite scary how much data gets leaked because uh, ship it now and secure it later, right? <laughs> and it's not just hackers that, that do bad stuff with information. Um, Morrison's, all of their staff leaked. Uh, one of the senior auditors leaked all of their data. Uh, I think they're now in prison for, for it, but um, there's still a huge piece of uh, data that's now out there because someone leaked it. 
Heathrow Airport, someone lost a memory stick, which included all travel details of people, including the Queen's travel itinerary. Uh, again, it, it's crazy how much people will just lose data that, uh, with no encryption on it. A third of councils, so the, imagine all of the data that your council has on you, it's, it's huge. They, they lost, they've all reported lost or stolen data in the past five years. And a UK head teacher, I'm not sure how many people heard about this, there was um, a head teacher who moved schools, took all of their old school data with them to the new school, extracted it all on the network, and um, then started using that data in a, like, well, badly, really. So he, he then got sacked for it. But it's, a head teacher is sort of the equivalent of like a CEO in most places, in most like companies. So it's even like senior people in companies that, where you can't really trust with data. So does anyone know who this is? And Troy Hunt, that's right. He runs Have I Been Pwned. He'll, he tends to send two types of emails. The first one is um, your data has been leaked by some other company. And the second one is, is slightly more scary of uh, he's trying to verify a data breach. So if you receive one of these, this is, this is going to be a really bad day at work. He, he's received a data dump of your, your data, and he's just trying to verify that that actually is your data. So security is hard. Um, Schneider's law is any person can invent a security system so clever that he, uh, she or he cannot think how to break it. But that also means that lots of people can think how to break it. And with GDPR, it's um, it, it's a lot more a lot more focused on customer data. Um, they suggest encryption. Well, that they uh, they suggest that all of your data is encrypted, and. They even say that a loss of an encrypted storage medium which holds personal data is not necessarily considered a data breach. So if, if all these people before had this data encrypted, it's not necessarily considered a data breach if they lose it. And if you do use encryption, then the authorities must positively consider the use of encryption in, in whether, or whether a fine is imposed or what amount of fine is imposed. So if you're looking for ways to sort of tell people that you need to have encryption, this is a great one because it reduces the liability of your company if your data is encrypted properly. Um, oh, and you, yeah, you shouldn't underestimate the importance of good key management. So we'll get onto a bit more of this later. But if you, if you lose one of your, so if one of your data, if one of your servers get breached, you either lose your key or your data, um, and then you should really rotate that. But we'll, we'll show you how that happens later on. So what can we do to fix it? So Dropbox, they, they had their password leaked, and now they have one of the best password um, storage methods, possibly, really. Uh, so the password's in the center of it. They then SHA-512 it, then bcrypt it, then, um, then encrypt the whole thing. So going through layer by layer, the SHA-512 is to make the, the string a consistent length and use every bit of the string. Bcrypt only uses the first 72 characters. So the SHA-512 uses the whole string, so it can be longer than 72 characters, and it's consistent. Uh, so bcrypt longer passwords take longer to, to hash, shorter ones take a shorter amount of time. Uh, we, by doing this, uh, you kind of get around all that, and it's much more consistent. And then on top of all of that is the um, AES-256 encryption. And the point of that is if your database leaks, then people haven't got the hashes anymore. They've got data that they can't use. So it's just adding layers to security. And all good security is, like an ogre, it has layers. So ogres have layers, security has layers. Ogres have layers, security has layers. So what can we do to add layers to our database for, for securing it? So firewall the database off. Surprisingly, people don't do this as often as they should. Uh, it should be the first thing you do. The, your database shouldn't be accessible by anyone but your applications. Clearly, the, the Chinese database for that was all leaked because it was accessible from the outside. <laughs> have only the trusted clients on your network connect to it. So not, not even your entire network should be able to connect to it, just, just the ones that you trust to connect to it. And then the, with those applications, the minimum access. So uh, if you only need to select from a few tables, only give the permissions for those few tables. Full disk encryption, it's, it's OK. Um, I don't really recommend doing it for servers. There's, uh, there's a little slide on that later on. Um, but what more can you do? Um, so looking at this code, this is, this is used quite well everywhere, really. Um, you set up your connections to the database, you query it, you get all your data from the users, um, and then you iterate over it. If this was 
if this was used as an API, everyone would be saying that there's no encryption there, HTTPS isn't used, but that's never really the case for databases, nobody considers it. It's, it's actually quite easy to use encryption with MySQLi. You, you just um, tell MySQL to verify the certificate, give it the path to the certificate, this exists for PDO as well, but it should be the first part that you do because people can, if someone does breach a part of your network, then they can sniff the network traffic to the database, which is now all plain, and all of your customer data is going all over this plain traffic. If it's encrypted, you can't sniff it anymore. So encryption at rest, this was the, um, this, this was mentioned before, disk level encryption. You just can't start without a password. It's a bit clunky for starting servers. You need to be there to type your password in. It's much better for devices which haven't got five lines availability. So my laptop, that is full disk encryption uh, because if I take it somewhere and it's out of battery, then people can't use it. But my servers, they're, they're on all of the time, so it's just a, a slight slowdown, really. Um, I, I, I wouldn't really recommend using the, the full disk encryption unless you're required to for audit reasons. Um, your backups, so when you're when you've done your backups, you don't keep it on the same server, you send that somewhere else. That's now, your backup's now plain text somewhere else. Uh, all of your bin logs there uh, until MySQL 8.14, I think, 8.0.14. All of your bin logs weren't, weren't able to be encrypted either, so any other MySQL servers that you had, when they were trying to keep up to date with your replication, they weren't encrypted. Um, so again, that traffic can be sniffed. <coughs> so, what can we do about it? And the answer really, I think, is application-level encryption. So now your application knows the keys. Your database is just storing data. Your database has got no idea what any of this data is. It's just storing like chunks of data. It encourages the one application, one key approach, so only one application can talk to that, that uh, data. Um, it, and it still allows scaling, so you can still auto-scale, you can still do all of that. It's a little bit more difficult to implement because you, you've now got a You've now got to do uh, user application a lot more for uh, stuff that it wouldn't have been used for previously, and we've got some examples of that in a minute. So any, any security system has um, the CIA triad, and that, that means um, confidentiality. So is the data you hold secret? Can everyone see it? Integrity, can you trust the data? How do you know it's not been tampered with? And availability, is the data available? So confidentiality, what access controls are there? Who can see it? Uh, does that data have any protection? Uh, integrity, if someone changed it, how would you know that? I find integrity quite scary. If someone's in, inserting records or changing your records, how would you ever know that? Uh, if you restored a backup, are you certain it's a match? Are you, are you sure your replicas are a complete match? Um, could someone have changed one of them and, and introduced something odd in your application that, that gives them a benefit somehow? How would you ever know? That, that's the, the scary question with integrity. Uh, availability, this is probably the most talked about one. Is the data available to those who need it? So um, DDoS attacks, they're common to attack availability. They're trying to remove the availability of the application. Um, does, the, does whatever it is come back in a timely fashion? So if you're, you're using your database, can you get your answers back in a timely fashion? And is it up all of the time? So, Looking at how we do the encryption, the easy way, and I've done this a few times, um, MySQL is quite useful. It comes with this AES encrypt function where you, you pass the text you're encrypting with the key and it will just encrypt it and you know, you're away. MySQL defaults to AES128, uh, which NIST says is secure until 2030. It's still indexable because whatever goes in is exactly the same as what comes out, so you just index the, the uh, results of this. So um, it's, it's still nice and fast to search. Um, but it's not particularly secure. So here's some, some data that was encrypted with it. Um, you can see it, it's a surname because based on the column, and uh, back down here is a list of um, data that got encrypted with it, which, looking at that on its own, you would never be able to get back. When you start adding, adding dimensions to the data, so first name, you can see that the first name here matches the second line here, and it happens again there and there. And these are, these are things where, like my, my first name is also a common surname. So that could be my first name, that could be my surname, uh, that could be my first name as well. So Scott, Scott, that's a different name that has that characteristic where, where it can be a first name, can be a surname. And um, 
again, if you add another dimension to it, like department, you can then start using public information, like LinkedIn, to try and work out who these people are. And uh, it actually just becomes a big puzzle. People who, who like programming get the, the feeling of the buzz when, when they get something right. You get a huge feeling of buzz when you start connecting these things together. As always, there's an XKCD for everything. Um, when the Adobe passwords leaked, they, they left the hints as plain text, and it, it's basically a crossword puzzle. And uh, you, you're trying to avoid that with your data. It, people shouldn't be able to piece back bits of data to try uh, to work out what the, um, what the encrypted part of it is. <coughs> so um, th this is also a famous example, so unencrypted. Um, there's the Tux Penguin. Encrypted with ECB, there's kind of also the Tux Penguin. So people, when they've fed this data to it, would think, oh yeah, it's all, it's all different now, it is definitely encrypted. But true encryption just looks like noise. So it's hard to be able to tell the difference between those two. Um, and, and not knowing that you're using ECB. ECB is electronic cookbook, and it's, um, it's, it's quite an old way of doing things. It works on blocks, and that's why, it, that's why the blocks end up like this. So other issues are your network traffic um, and your binary logs and your backups. So if you're using this, a if you're using the uh, AES encrypt, all of your network traffic, you're still sending all that to MySQL with the plain text data. Um, uh, sorry, with the uh, encryption key because both servers need to know it now: the database server and the application server. Your bin logs have all those updates as well, and your backups all have um, your backups will have that same sort of information there. So you've not really solved a lot of problems. You can salt it to make it a bit better, but it, it's not a, a proper solution, really. Uh, you need to store the salt on each row. Uh, it doesn't change over time, so um, e every time you, you do something, it'll, it'll go back to the same method. There's no sort of random about it. Um, and the weak salts just slow down the guessing attempts, so uh, it, it just it makes the crossword puzzle slightly harder for somebody. It doesn't actually stop it. So in terms of CIA, we've got, we've got the availability, really. The CI and the I don't really exist, so it's a, it's a no. So what else can we do? If you search for PHP encryption, you get OpenSSL Encrypt. Um, OpenSSL Encrypt, that's the, the signature for it. It really does uh, need somebody who's quite interested in cryptography to understand what all of this is. IV is initialization vector. Who knows what that does? Uh, AAD, I have no idea, tag length, it's all, it's all random stuff, and you shouldn't need to know all of this, it should be much easier. The other one that comes up quite a lot is Encrypt, but it's deprecated, it's not been maintained forever, so um, even though when you search for a lot of these things, OpenSSL Encrypt and Encrypt are, are top results, please don't use them. As of PHP 7.2, with the first modern language, uh, first language to have modern encryption built in, so LibSodium is now baked into the core of it. Uh, with most things, simplicity is the best, but not with encryption. But the the simplicity is hidden by by Libsodium. Libsodium does a lot behind the scenes. It, it does a lot of stuff that you won't know it's doing. So how can we use it? Um, unfortunately, because it's still quite new, this is the PHP documentation as of now. Uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't really get you anywhere. And uh, when you look at one of the functions, it just says it's not currently documented. Uh, fortunately, um, Paragon Initiatives, they've, they've got a book on it, and it is very, very good. Uh, I'm not sure why, why these things aren't in the official documentation, but these are the people that really pushed, um, pushed Libsodium into PHP. So definitely recommend looking there for the, for the user guides. And this is how you would use it. So uh, you'd, you'd first create your nonce. Um, a nonce is a number used only once, and it was clear that nobody in the UK was ever consulted about the name. Uh, then uh, working from the inside in, so you, you, get, you set up your secret box with the message you're encrypting, you pass in the nonce that you've just generated up there, and the key, so the, the secret key for your application. You then uh, append your nonce to it and base64 the, the entire thing. And then for security, you, you use sodium mem0, which just zeroes out the memory so people can't even look at the memory of your server and, and work out what's there. And then you return the ciphertext. So it really is quite easy to use. Crypto secret box, um, it does authentication, and oh, I think it's on the next slide. So it uses CharCha20 and Poly1305. So CharCha20 provides your encryption, and Poly1305 provides your authentication, so that's like a Mac around the whole thing. 
So if somebody changes one part of it, then the Mac doesn't authenticate, and the char char 20 then doesn't even get used. So it, um, it really is encryption with integrity, uh, which is, you can do it with OpenSSL, but it's, it's clunky. This is baked in, it's dead easy to use. All handled internally, and you don't have to worry about any of it. So now your salt's been replaced with the nonce, so nonce is used at one time, so if I encrypt the same word twice, it'll be completely different each time. It's verified by Mac. It's um, not quite CIA still. It's closer, uh, but you haven't got your availability because everything's now different, so you can't index it. So all of your data is now 100% secure, but uh, you've got to do a full table scan and a full decrypt every time you want to use it, which is less than ideal. If you've got very large databases, um, it takes quite a while. So the size of database we had at Sykes took about six hours to encrypt, and you don't want every query you do taking six hours on your database. That'll upset a lot of people. So thinking about how, how to make the indexing faster, you have to think about what computers are good at, and they're, they're good at comparing numbers and basic operations with numbers. <laughs> and that leads to a Bloom filter. Um, a Bloom filter is... It has two outcomes. It, uh, outcome one is it's definitely not the data you're looking for, and outcome two is it could be the data you're looking for. So it's exactly like a, an old style phone book. So if you, if you look for um, S, then Scott could be on the page, or it, it could not be on the page, but if you, look, if you look in A, Scott is definitely not on the page. It's, uh, it's as simple as that. So a plain text example, um, your Bloom filter would just be BS, it would bring back a list of everyone, so you'd loop through that result set. The first one you're looking for is Scott. So you'd say, yeah, that's it. You'd carry on looping through it. Um, Sarah, no. Sam, no. Summer, no. Sky, no. Samuel, no. So you've got to the end of the result set, and you've, you've had to filter that in PHP, but uh, it's, it's a much smaller result set, and you've got the, the data you're looking for. Um, but to scale that, 26 characters, you still need to read 126th of your database uh, for 100,000 records. That's like nearly 4,000 records. And you, you do have information leakage. Um, so the start letter is an S, and that, that really does um, help with trying to crack these things because you've got information that you already know about it. So what can we do to, to change that? We can use different functions for it. So Sodium has something called Crypto Short Hash, the CRC32, which uh, is used for every TCP connection. That verifies that everything is correct, and XX hash, which is it's lightning fast. Um, it's used for a lot of video streaming. Um, truncate these if you need them. Ideally, you want um, you, you want collisions in your Bloom filter, but you don't want lots of collisions in it. So um, it, these th this here returns a 64-bit number, which is absolutely massive. Most people don't need that. You'll probably need about 16 to 20 bits of it, depending on your data size. Uh, but you'll have to. Um, you're basically aiming for a number that's hot, about half of your data size uh, for, your, for the size of your Bloom filter. So the encrypted example, so these are, now, these are now values that have been through these functions, and it's exactly the same thing as the Bloom filter before. So this value here, there's nine of them. Uh, these could be the, the same, they could be different, who knows. You've got to loop through every once to try it. So you'd look up your key, so um, it's deterministic each time. So if you do like CRC32, um, Scott, that could be that number, and then you've got to look, loop through all of those nine and decrypt it to verify it's the right value. So here is the all nine of these rows. You'd have to loop through each one, decrypt that, make sure that that email is what you're looking for, um, and then return the correct value. If people have used generators in PHP before, this is a fantastic use case for generators. If you haven't used generators, uh, I would definitely suggest looking them up. You basically use the yield keyword and then um, your function can carry on, and then when it needs more data, it would go back and then get more data out of the function. So it's, it's a slightly different concept, but they're, they're very, very good in this instance. <coughs> so uh, the final result is you can finally hit the index. Your Bloom filters allow you to hit the index because that, that is a much smaller result. You've got collisions, and it's, it's much safer. Um, your data is still secure, and it can be taken further if you need to. So you've finally got your... Your CIA, all three are, are fine, and you, your indexes are now really fast again, and all your data is secure. So how do you move to encryption? The easiest solution is uh, get the change ready in your application, put your application in maintenance mode, run a job to loop over your database, encrypt all this data, make your, make your Bloom filters and your indexes, change the, structure, uh, sorry, change the structure, encrypt it all, add the indexes, release that change, and then end your maintenance mode. Clearly, there's downtime there, 
so although it's easy, it's not, it's not really feasible. People don't really want to have downtime to do these sort of things. So how do you do that without downtime? So first step, you'd add your new columns, or however you want to do it. Um, you can have like one, one single column for all of your encrypted data, or multiple columns. It's however you decide, really. Um, you change your application to read both the encrypted and the plain text versions. So at this point in time, you're your uh, plain text and your encrypted ones are being uh, written, but only the plain text ones are being read. Run a back population script to move over all of your old data from your plain text version to your encrypted version. So however long that takes, and then you would uh, run a second job to verify that, um, just to make sure that everything has actually moved as you expected it to. Uh, remember that, that at this point you're still reading from the plain text, so all of, these, all of this new stuff isn't being used. <coughs> when you're happy that it, everything is there and it's all fine, you change your application to read from the encrypted columns. So now your plain text ones are still there, but they're not being read from. And you can monitor your performance. You can make sure that everything is now moving over properly. Uh, the next bit is to remo remove the read permissions from the old columns. And the reason you remove the read permissions is because if some part of your application that you've missed suddenly stops working, it's very easy to add the read permissions back in. If you've dropped the column, it's not as easy to add all your data back in. So remove the read permissions from that one column. Uh, and then change your application to write only the encrypted. And then once you're happy that everything is there, you can remove the plain text columns, just drop them, and all of your data now should be fully encrypted in a, a safe way that required no downtime. And uh, after all that, you can sleep better at night knowing that your data is fully encrypted, and uh, even if your database does leak, nobody can uh, use all of the data from there. That all of your customers' data is safe. Uh, and remember to use an interface in all of this. I see quite a lot of people when they implement these sort of things to do if else statements and it gets really, really messy. Just use your interface. Put, put an interface in there that does the writing, put an interface in there that does the reading, and use your dependency injection framework to, uh, or a feature toggle framework to switch between which one gets used. It makes it really nice. Um, Dan Aykroyd's got a fantastic presentation on interface segregation. Um, if you've got time, give that a watch. Uh, it, it's really, really useful. So something pre-made, uh, the encryption we've just talked about, Paragon Initiative have got something called Cypher Suite. If you're just using basic encryption like we just talked about, then definitely just use that. that that'll that solve most people's use cases. It's all in libsodium, and it's all, it's all really well written. It, it's got hooks for like doctrine and stuff like that, so if you're using doctrine, it, it all just links into it. It's really, really good. It, it makes it very easy to move to it. But if you've got something that's slightly more complex, it's, it's a bit harder to move to things like that. So you've got, for example, application A, application B, write, read and, uh, well, one's uh, read and writes to the database, one's just write to the database. Or if you've got uh, like a reporting server that reads from the database and your application reads and writes to it, it's a bit more hard, it's a bit more difficult to set up because um, you can't just have that one key uh, system. So ideally, a chance for a refactor. If you can make the application, a depend, application B depend on application A, which then reads and writes to the database. That's sometimes not feasible, but if it is, that's definitely the way forward. Or uh, if your reporting server is, it, it probably really shouldn't be reading any of this personal data, so you can probably just leave as it is, but if it does read it, then you, you need to maybe refactor it to read from the application <coughs> instead. Uh, but if you can't, then you can use asymmetric, asymmetric encryption. So this is what's known as a hybrid crypt system, and it's used by things like GPG and WhatsApp. So. Um, this, base, this is when you have like uh, a group message in WhatsApp. Everyone's message gets individually encrypted, but everyone can decrypt it. And uh, this is how we, this is how you do it in Libsodium. So again, you'd get your um, you'd get your one-time key, so your, your nonce. Um, you'd encrypt your data with that key. Uh, yeah, sorry, you didn't. It was not a nonce. Sorry, you'd, you'd get your key. You'd get your password, but randomly generated. You'd encrypt your data with that randomly generated key, and then you'd encrypt that key with the public key of each application. So um, each application you need to do would have uh, its own public key encrypted, uh, would have its own key, inc that key encrypted with its public key so they'd all be different. Uh, then you would save all of the data, um, something like this. So your applications, application one's got its secret encrypted with app one's key, and application two's got its secret encrypted with um, the other one. And then payload is the, the shared payload. <coughs> so to read it, you would look up the Bloom filter value as before. You'd find the data row and then look up the application-specific key, decrypt the secret, decrypt the data, and then you've got everything you need to do. See if it needs to be filtered and then maybe move on. So 
as an example here, here's your JSON array containing all your encrypted data. You'd find that you've your application two, so you'd get the you'd look up application two. You'd then decrypt the secret, so that uh, it's now now known to application two. You'd then uh, use that secret to decrypt the payload, and then get just the payload out of it. And this is how it was looking code. So um, when you're decrypting it, you decode that that array that we had there, and make sure you throw ex throw um, errors on exceptions. Uh, sorry, throw. Um, exceptions if there's any error at all. Um, you'd look up your application in the for loop, and if you've got it, then you get the key. Uh, if there's no found key, then you, you say you can't decrypt it. And then you, you use the same uh, decrypt version that we, we talked about earlier, just with a single key this time, passing in the, the application key's private key uh, to get it, and then you would um, decrypt the whole thing. So it, it's quite, quite easy to do. It's not many lines of code. Um, your bloom filter has become a little bit more difficult because you either need to have a, 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 the, the secret key. So before we had a secret key per, for the application. Now you can either use no secret key, so just literally um, pass in the data to CRC32, for example. Or you can use a global one, so everything, everyone in your application <laughs> uses the same key. Or you can just use per application, so each application's got its own key and each application's then got its own index. That's a lot harder to get to, but if you're using things like um, event sourcing, it's a bit easier because you, you say that this data has changed, and then each each application can then generate their own bloom filters. Uh, so if you are if you have got like an event-driven architecture, then per application is quite easy. If you haven't, global is much easier. Uh, and some things to be aware of when you do these sort of things: um, truncated data. So MySQL is quite helpful in the fact that if you just uh, insert stuff into it. It, um, it'll just say, yeah, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll try and do the best that I can. So before 5.7, the default was to silently truncate a string. So if you've got a column that's defined as a char one, you insert two characters into it, it just stores A and gives you a warning. It's, uh, it's quite useful in some cases because you, you still get a lot of data, but now you've got that Mac on all of your encryption. Uh, if you've lost a single value of it, your Mac doesn't pass anymore, which means you've lost all of the data. So uh, it, it, Really, you should really try and enable um, your application to throw errors when when this sort of things happen. Because um, if if it has happened, you've lost that data. Then, uh, so this is one of the things you should be checking for when you're verifying that your application is doing things correctly. Uh, case sensitivity again, MySQL is uh, helpful. That you probably don't realize it, it does this a lot of the time. It defaults to Latin one, Swedish uh, case insensitive for less than eight and greater than eight. It defaults to UTF-8 multibyte. Uh, accent insensitive and case insensitive. Your application probably depends on it. Uh, you probably don't know your application depends on it. But if you search for like an uppercase version of an email address or a lowercase version of an email address, it doesn't matter when you encrypt it and your uh, your bloom filters then do matter. So you need to make your bloom filters do this sort of thing as well. So the easy way to do that is just to string to lower all anything that goes in your bloom filters and store the the lowercase version of it. Um, but yeah, you probably. You probably just need to make sure that um, you can get your data back out when you when you do these things. Uh, white space as well. Uh, the SQL standard, uh, SQL 92, it is. Um, it requires you pad the strings so that the strings compared are exactly the same length. So if you compare um, like one one word with a space at the end of it and one word without a space at the end of it, uh, it adds the space to the end of the first word and then compares those two strings. They're now identical. So it, it says that they match. Uh, and when you do things like that, it's basically trimming it for you. Um, but your application, again, probably might depend on it. Uh, so you need to check that. There's a DB fiddle if you want to play with that. But it happens for most uh, major database engines, that anyone that follows SQL 92, which is a good chunk of them. It's just not an obvious thing that it does. Uh, performance tweaks. So um, you can change your, co uh, your column collation. So Latin one's fine for it because uh, it's now just base 64 encoded data. It's probably the only time I'd ever suggest to use Latin one over UTF-8, but y you can uh, save a lot on storage um, if, if you do need to save on storage. Um, if you, your row format should be dynamic if you want to have multiple, multiple big strings in your, in your tables. If it isn't dynamic, which is uh, like when you've got like all the tables, then you have issues with, uh, with only um, it stores all the data off somewhere else, so you have issues like performance issues with it. 
dynamic, there's no performance issues, so you can store everything individually. If you haven't got dynamic, just store it with one big JSON blob. Uh, after 5.7, it's the default, so if, uh, if you're using that, then you definitely are using dynamic. But always check with your DBA if you're unsure about any of the performance on there. Compression, something that gets talked about quite a lot. Uh, encrypted data is slightly bigger, um, so people say, come in, just compress it. But HTTPS, breach, and crime, they both attack the compression layer before they got encrypted. So you don't, don't compress it unless you know that you're absolutely certain it's safe against uh, the types of attack that happened in those two. It's not, then it's not that much bigger, just pay for the storage. Uh, ciphertext isn't compressible, so don't even, try to don't even try to compress that, just store it as is. Unique keys, so um, sometimes personal data is used with the unique keys. Uh, you need to move that to the application now. It's quite, quite commonly used with email address, so you put a unique constraint on the email address, and um, now your application has to do that logic, so the application then has to look up to see if that email address has been used before. Um, so any, anywhere where you have got a unique key in your database, just make sure that that isn't used with personal data, otherwise you'll have to change your application to also do that after you've started your encryption. Fuzzy matches, so uh, something else people do is they want to know where email addresses are like hotmail.com, so anyone who's using Hotmail, or like a, a salary between X and Y, so they'll get a list of people who, who earn a certain amount. It's possible, but these things need to be known in advance. So you, you'd build your Bloom filter on the domain part, so you, you'd split out the domain part, build your Bloom filter on the, just the hotmail.com part or just the, the gmail.com part, and uh, that would be a separate Bloom filter that you could then look up each time. But that has to be known in advance. You, you can't just, someone can't just come along and say, I need to know this now, because it involves decrypting all of your rows to work that out. The salary between X and Y is harder because it's a Boolean value. I've got a slide on that in a minute. Um, it, it's harder, but it's, it's still possible. It's just it's difficult. Uh, key management. So um, if you lose a key, now you lose all of your data, which is quite important because uh, that key is only like 16 bytes or something crazy. But that now represents your entire data. So if for whatever reason you lose that, you've lost everything. Uh, keeping, it, ca keeping it secret can be hard. Like th your applications to scale do need to know that. Uh, certain people will need to know that in the business. If they need to be able to restore a backup, for example, they'll need to be able to get the key. Um, Auto-scaling complicates it a little bit because uh, whatever's spinning up those servers now needs to be able to put that key on the box, but there are solutions for it. Uh, HSM is the, the, probably the best solution, but they're very expensive. AWS offer KMS as well, which they, they have the HSM for you and they, um, they just store what, um, your portion of it on the HSM. So uh, if, you, if you are using AWS, KMS is fine. If you're not using AWS, Vault is very, very good. Uh, I'd definitely recommend using Vault, or if there's, there's other secret key management systems. Uh, if you can, though, probably stick to those two. They're, they, are, they are really good. Um, your key rotation. So you need to talk, think about how you're going to rotate your keys. So when you rotate it, it's going to be basically the same process as moving to encryption, because you'll need to uh, put the new encrypted rows in there and um, basically go along that same process again. Uh, if your key is compromised, you need to think about ro uh, getting rid of all your data and rotating it all, because uh, if someone ever does then breach your data, then um, they've got the key for it as well, so you've, you've basically lost your data. If someone uh, breaches your data first, then you've, your key is saved, so rotate that key again. If either one get breached, just make sure you can rotate them, and it, it's possible to. You can even think about rotating on a certain time period. So every six months, for example, if you then ever get breached, you can then uh, date when some attacker's got your data, you'll be able to know exactly when they were in your network, and uh, hopefully that should be able to help flushing them out. <laughs> Moving data to cache, this, one, this one's uh, actually quite common as well. So using Redis and Memcache, you, you pull out all this data from the database, you decrypt it all, and you think, all right, I'll just throw it all in, in Redis because uh, now it's lightning fast to look up again. But you've basically just moved your, your uh, unencrypted data to Redis, and Redis got a lot less, um, like, uh, security around it uh, than sort of MySQL, so, but you, you've basically moved it from one data store to another. So if you are you, if you are using Redis and Memcache, make sure you install, you're storing the encrypted versions and just decrypt it every time your application needs it. Uh, low entropy data. So this is the Boolean values we talked about before. It, it's hard. You're you need to avoid 
avoid storing it. Your indexes probably didn't work as, as you thought they did before. Uh, MySQL doesn't particularly work, well, any database doesn't work particularly well with Boolean data indexed. Uh, because unless they're roughly equal, one of them is always, one of, one's gonna be higher than the other, so like there's gonna be more falses than trues or more trues than falses, at which point most database engines will be like, oh, I may as well do a full table scan because it's gonna be quicker to do the full table scan than it is to look up each row individually from the index. Um, you can do Booleans, you can just, you can store it. Um, th there's two ways that you can do it really. You can just store it with, uh, with another bit of the data so that it gets a bit more entropy, or you can put some fake values in to uh, like, I don't know, seed the bloom filter a bit more so that there's more, more values that don't match in the bloom filter. Um, so your bloom filter is really just, uh, as long as not everything matches, that, that's what you're trying to get. So uh, you don't want to be able to look up just the bloom filter and get your data back. You need, you need some ones that don't match, but only your application can know that. So you just need to uh, put some more data in. <coughs> and uh, timing attacks. So now because you're with, so like my request, for example, will have other customers' data in there while it's trying to filter it out. Um, this is the, this is what happens when PHP does uh, string equals. So if you do like one string equals 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 another string, this is the the process it goes through. So it checks the string length equals the string length of the second string. Um, if that's true, then it carries on. If it's false, it exits very early. So it's it's quite it's quite surprising how much data you can get from this. Um, so that if you if you can try this at home. Um, writing a simple script just to compare two strings. It, when the strings match, it's actually quite a bit slower, so you, you can really tell, do it, if you iterate over it like you know, 15 or 20 times, you'd be able to tell how big that data is, not knowing what that data is. And then the end string equals val, that depends on your architecture, uh, it, it's, all, it's all been rewritten now, but basically just loops through character by character. So um, the more of your string matches, the slower it gets, and you can then work out uh, slowly again over time what that data is being compared against. So instead of using triple equals, use hash equals, which is timing attack safe. Uh, anytime when there's co other customer data in included in your request, make sure you use hash equals. And uh, thank you for listening. Is there any questions? There's the time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. There's Part of CIA uh, integrity, um, and a lot of your talk was about uh, encryption. Yep. Is there a particular? You mentioned the example. Yeah. Is there a particular method that you use to ensure integrity of the database? So Libsodium does all of that. The entire row, you mean, or, or just the data you're looking at, like the. Um, so Libsodium does all of it built in, so uh, go back to uh, wherever it was. Uh, so it's not the other Libsodium one. Sorry. Um, So Libsodium, when you do the, when you use um, the, the crypto secret box, that does all of the integrity for you. If it's the entire row that you're looking at, then um, then you, you would just again, you can just get the integrity out of this. So you just use the poly 1305 again for the whole row. Uh, all you're really defending against there, though, is somebody having access to your database and moving one one slight bit of data to another bit of data. So like one um, one portion of the data to another another row. So it's kind of a known attack then. Um, for most cases, using Lib, uh, Sodium crypto, box, crypto Secret Box will do all of that for you, so you don't have to worry about any of it. Uh, but if you do need the whole row, then just use the, the Poly1305 methods of it. Uh, if, you, if you look at the Libsodium guide, there's, there's ways on how to just use the Poly1305 portion. Thank you.
Hello, thanks for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you about how do you maintain your development environment in this respect? Do you also, on your local machine, in development cluster, do you also maintain all this uh, cipher, security key rotation? Yeah, you should be trying to keep it in there, but don't use the, the same key as live, so each environment should have its own secret key. Um, the, your, your dev environment, your stage environment, they should, they should be using things like Faker to generate the data, so that there's no actual customer data in there, uh, and each one of them should, should represent live with the same way of, uh, it's still encrypted, all of this fake data is now encrypted, but uh, everyone knows the key is the difference. On live, nobody knows the key. Okay, so you're, for example, maintaining a walled solution in your development cluster, just the security rules, the key rotation, all this is relaxed. Uh, yeah, we, don't, we haven't actually rotated any keys or anything yet, but um, yeah, I, I, I would try and make your dev environment and your stage environments match as closely to your live ones as possible. When you start introducing um, like differences, that's when you start getting weird errors that you can't easily then reproduce. So you should always try a dev stage and, and then put it on live when you're happy everything's working. But everything in live should be kind of replicated in dev and staging. Okay, thank you very much. Um, when I've done a bit of encryption, our stuff's come out as binary. What would you recommend storing it as hex or binary in the database? Um, I've stored it as hex just so it's a bit more readable, uh, but binaries work just as, as well. well. Uh, yeah, it, it's just a bit easier for people to work with. It doesn't really make a difference either way. Um, if you're comfortable looking at it in binary, then, then go for it. People kind of like to see it in their database engines that they can still read it, but you can't really do that with binary data, you end up with weird characters. So hexing's fine. Any other? Hi, something you said uh, during the migration bit um, made me think. Um, so would you recommend, obviously in a classic database, you have columns of data stored. Uh, once you go through encryption, does it make more sense to just have a blob with uh, unstructured data and then one key encrypting the whole lot? It really is up to you. So the way we've done it is to uh, have uh, an encrypted version of each one. So there's like a, a surname encrypted uh, and all of that. Uh, there's loads of columns um, that you can then use. The benefit of that is each, because you get more data back with the requests anyway. Um, if you had everything in a big blob, you'd be getting loads and loads of data back from your Bloom filters. If you put it in just the, the date you want, so like just the surname or just the email address, it really does reduce the network time down. So uh, it, it depends on your application. It's easier uh, to use it as one big blob, but I, I think it's better to use it as multiple <laughs> columns. Uh, check with your specific application then. Yeah, so you, you'd still have uh, individual Bloom filters for each column that you'd be yeah. interested in indexing. Uh, so no, so the Bloom filters I store in a separate table usually. Um, with a, so like the, the first, there's like two, two columns in there. First column is the what type of data it is. Second column is the Bloom filter value. So it would say like surname, Bloom filter, surname, Bloom filter. Um, that's how I store my Bloom filters, but you can store a Bloom filter in line. The, diff the difficulty with storing it in line is if you need to start doing things like your likes and your fuzzy matches, then you need each another column for each one of them and it quickly gets out of hand because you've got a lot of columns to maintain. Sure. So the data itself I store in different columns, but the, um, the Bloom filters I store in a table in each row. Okay. So uh, if you have the data, so different databases like DynamoDB or uh, uh, MySQL, they offer uh, an encryption at rest. So the data is all encrypted at rest. Uh, why should we go for the blue, blue filter and just... So the encryption at rest, it, it really only depends against when your application's offline. When, it, when your application's working, it, it may as well not be there because you, you're still reading the plain text values out. Um, so, it, for example, if you get a, an SQL injection attack on your website, if you've got full disk encryption, people will still get your entire database out. It won't make a difference. If you've got uh, the application level encryption, they won't be able to get the whole database out. And even if they do get the whole database out, it's, it is fully encrypted. So uh, your application level, uh, so your, um, like your full disk encryption, it depends against some things, but I don't think it depends against servers very well because they're always on. Thank you. There's just one at the front as well. Uh, just from a project and team perspective, how long did it take you to go from uh, all plain text in your database to fully encrypted, and how many of your team are, are fully 
uh, you know, understanding the way this works? Uh, we're still trying to get it in, so we, um, I've used it on other projects. Uh, at Sykes, we're, we're trying to get it in. The peak period for travel is in uh, January, so it was a bit risky to go for this January. As soon as the peak period's over, we're going to uh, look at getting it properly in there. We've got proof of concepts working and things like that, uh, but in terms of lots of developers using it, we've not kind of got there yet. Uh, I've used it on, on smaller projects of my own, but uh, we're, we're still moving it into Sykes at the minute. Uh, there's a question at the front. Uh, just at the front, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you for your talk. It was a lot of useful information. But uh, I was wondering, will you make your slides available afterwards? So we can yeah, they'll up? all be on Joined In straight after. Um, yeah. So yeah, have a look on Joined In. Uh, rate the talk while you're there. So we can download your slides and look at or look up the information. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Hi, uh, um, this is about caching. Yeah. So, um, so you mentioned that we need to store the encrypted data and then we need to decrypt it every time. So is it going to affect the performance at all? Very, very yeah. slightly. So the, the performance, you actually, it, it's a bit weird, the performance, because you're using the Bloom filters now, and um, they're based on numbers, so based on integer columns. So for the, the database lookup, I know it's not specifically cached, but for the database lookup, you get a slight speed increase by, by using Bloom filters rather than text searching. Um, and then you get a slight decrease by, the, uh, by having the encrypted value then decrypted. Uh, so for the caches, you'll just get the slight decrease, but for uh, for the applications I was writing, it was about 3% decrease of speed, so it wasn't noticeable. Uh, but you, uh, one of the things as you move into it, you need to make sure that your performance is there. If it isn't there, there's, there's probably some reason why it isn't there. The, the um, CharCharT20 is designed for most, for most dark sections to be really fast. So um, it, it's probably not going to be the bottleneck in your application, but have your uh, monitoring turned on. There's loads of things like Datadog, New Relic, that they, they monitor your application's performance. Uh, when you do start doing these things, make sure that you definitely do monitor it, though. Uh, it, it shouldn't make much of a difference to your performance, though. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Right at the back. It's right at the back row. Hi, um, I'm curious about the key management. You mentioned the fact that uh, if you're not careful with your keys, losing 16 bytes loses you all of your data. Yeah. Um, and wasn't, that wasn't really addressed in the talk. Is there any advice you can give for dealing with that? Um, it, it, so Vault is very good. I, I would try and use Vault or, or the H, HSM. HSM, you get the guaranteed safety with it. Uh, Vault uh, is, is trying to be the HSM, really. Uh, so it, it's, it's managing your keys for you. Uh, but the difficulty is that a lot of people might have access to Vault, so it's about trying to reduce the amount of people with it, but, um, but making sure it is still secure in that environment, so only the applications that need to know it are in there, and make sure you back up your Vault, obviously. And um, can you forgive my ignorance? I don't know what the HSM is. It's a hardware security module. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's basically a hardware key that, that stores all of your, your stuff for you. Um, they're expensive, but they're very good. Uh, I think Amazon's is about 16 grand a year. So uh, if you don't currently have HSM, I wouldn't recommend just using it for this. Use something like KMS or Vault. But if you do have a HSM, throw it in the HSM. Okay. 